the uh, it would always help if uh, if uh, the users who are in a position to to understand would apply pressure on their ISPs to provide uh, an IPv6 service to them. Uh, whether that's realistic or not is is up for up for some question, I think. Um, what we find, though, uh, in terms of ISPs, is that in order to provide IPv6 services, the ISPs themselves rely on vendors to provide IPv6 equipment. And uh, many uh, vendors now, software and hardware vendors, are providing IPv6 upgrades and IPv6 capability, uh, often at an, at an additional cost. And, uh, and our message to them would be, please do not uh, apply any unreasonable additional cost, because that will be a disbenefit and a disincentive to to uh, deployment, uh, particularly in, in price sensitive uh, markets and, and developing countries. Uh, the other area which is one of, uh, of some importance is for content providers to be providing their content via IPv6 because until they do that there will always be a, a translation necessary between an end user who has an IPv6 connection and a Google or a, a site uh, which is only reachable through IPv4. And so there is quite a lot of publicity that needs to happen within the industry. I'm, I'm still a, a, a dubious personally as to whether or not at the end user level it's really realistic to s expect a groundswell of, uh, of demand for IPv6, although perhaps this is actually a question for the, for the at-large uh, community. We're doing our best. <laughs> Thank you. Can I just just take pick up one thing? Because I think your question is actually an, is an example of um, us us as a community being a little um, loose with the words we use. It's not a transition from IPv4 to IPv6. There is no point at which it suddenly stops being IPv4 and starts becoming IPv6. It, 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 th as Paul has said, they operate together right now. And the problem with the word transition is it implies a moment at which. And there, with with Y2K, there was a moment at which. The, the midnight on the first. Uh, in fact, at which nothing happened for most people. Um, but it's the, the, most of the of the up-to-date equipment. And I'm not a technical person, but my understanding is most of the up-to-date equipment operates both IPv6, IPv4, and IPv6 together. So it's just a case of of getting slowly IPv6 becoming the the the, the, the standard that's used as opposed to IPv4. Okay, we're, we're down to uh, basically a minute to go before we hit our six o'clock. So we've got two questions left. This one here, and we had a question here. About the uh, government as a stakeholder group, uh, I want to agree with uh, what you said, uh, that policy is not a bad word. So government is not a bad word. So there are some, uh, some governments have been very constructive and s some governments have been very constructive uh, in the process of uh, internet evolution. It is just that uh, some governments, uh, at the risk of uh, sounding uh, like uh, flattering France, France, I would uh, say that uh, uh, France is uh, steeped in the values of uh, liberty and equality and uh, as a nation, as a people, France is uh, more prone to understand uh, and appreciate uh, the values of uh, internet about uh, the internet model. Um, the same understanding may not be there uh, with an imaginary dictatorian regime somewhere in the middle of Atlantic. Uh, so what if uh, France works with that government and uh, make them understand the values of uh, internet or uh, India works with Pakistan to make uh, Pakistan understand or uh, Pakistan making India understand. So I want to sound uh, a little diplomatic here. So uh, is it possible that within this uh, stakeholder group, within government, one government which is in a better position to take the internet process further works with another government which is either at a a disadvantageous position in terms, in terms of money or uh, in terms of knowledge to make them understand uh, what internet really means and uh, why is it that uh, a government should take a libertarian view about uh, internet governance? Well, I must thank you because you understand that um, the way you formulated your question makes it a little bit hard to, uh, to answer directly. But there's one thing that is, that is clear and that I see as a very positive element, and I'm very serious here. 
During the World Summit on the Information Society, some of the principles that you mentioned have been not only put on paper, but formally endorsed. And they have been discussed during a period of four years. And now within the, uh, the IGF, they are being discussed further and in several other organizations. I can tell you that the mere fact that a large number of governments are accepting and finding an interest in being in the same room with actors that sometimes they didn't even talk to in their own country is incredibly beneficial to the promotion of this notion of interaction and of the values that the internet carries. The internet is about trust. You connect your network to another network and you abide by the same protocols. We are developing methods for interaction among actors who didn't work together, who didn't talk to one another. And one thing that I find very encouraging, and I finish with that, is the emergence at the national and at the regional level of exercises like the, IG the IGF. People are always talking about what is the outcome of the IGF. First of all, the outcome of the IGF and the meetings that have been taking place for the last three years is a different spirit for addressing those issues. And the second outcome is the cloning of this method. The second outcome is that now in various countries, in various regions, in Europe, but also, as was mentioned in the opening ceremony, in Kenya, sorry, in, in Kenya uh, for the uh, East African IGF, this methodology is being replicated. And I think this is the vehicle, more than one government going to one other government, that will promote the uh, values that you are uh, mentioning. Such a, such a good question. We've got four other comments, but we're going to ask people to keep them brief so that we can... Uh, multi-stakeholder meetings uh, each year in a conference style, quite a, a large event uh, at which we have uh, active government participation, we have participation of civil society and business and, uh, and the ISP community. We also have um, very good examples of, of special efforts being made, uh, in particular in the uh, European community with uh, RIPE NCC and their, their governmental roundtables which are highly successful in, in, uh, in exchange of information and, uh, and views and, and so forth, and it's really worth having a good look into the whole range of activities within this this whole ICANN community because there is uh, there's a lot more going on than we've had time to uh, to discuss in detail today. Thanks. Okay, we had one question there, and we had one question at the back, and that's final. In the domain, the community is about uh, Verisign being able to charge .tv style pricing for .com renewals and .com registrations. That means certain specific uh, domains, they'll be able to charge high prices like uh, for showbiz.tv, .tv is asking $3,000 a year. So, uh, is any such thing actually well, under consideration? It's not, it's not a question. It's not a question you can actually raise to ICANN. Dot has very specific provisions about prices for for the, the operator dot com, and what you're talking about is not possible under the contract. Uh, is there any way I can actually send the information via email? You could have a talk to Chuck directly, and he'll give you the answer. Oh, Chuck, uh, is, are you still with a very sign? <laughs> oh, we need to talk right afterwards. <laughs> Okay, final question. Language and character sets, and I can move forward step by step. Uh, I wonder what are the criteria and procedure in choosing the new language and character sets? Thank you. Must be a non Latin. Uh, non-Latin script um, and the actual string itself, the name chosen has to meet some uh, meaning, has to meet a requirement that it's meaningful uh, as the name of the of the territory but the language itself, if it, is, if it uses a non-Roman script uh, the only requirement is that a language table has been prepared or is prepared and is placed in what is called the IANA uh, repository of language tables, but perhaps I can come and talk to you uh, straight after this and, and explain that in a bit more detail. Can I just finish up by saying thank you very much for people's participation and, um, and thank you for those who are participants in the ICANN process not asking questions and letting those who are uh, less active doing so. Um, and if there are any further questions, um, the 
you know, please uh, find ways of asking us directly, that would be very useful. I think it's Francophonie that would be the best interlocutor because they have the, they have the network. Um, Is there you need, yes, you need to get in touch with somebody called Pietro Sicuro. Uh -huh. And it was from the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie. I met with the organizations based in, in Paris. Paris. Yeah. Yes. There's one thing that I would have picked up if we had more time. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the thing. It's, it's, it gets the juices going and then there's so much more to do. Yeah. And, and we do monthly... Oh, no, no, monthly briefings. Okay. We do monthly briefings for, which are for com community, uh -huh. our community, or anyone else, within or outside of ICANN, which are usually uh, well-experienced and technical bent, but they could be paired up with a consumer group that's interested in deaf Okay, so access. it's national... And, and so, yes, it, within any one country, you could have half a dozen at-large structures. The uh, test, and, and please have a look at our at-large yeah, website, yeah, because there's a few criteria you have to meet, yeah. and one is you represent end users of the internet. Yeah. So you've got a full access group from Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, once you get ad hoc networking, because these people have been in dialogue, then you can start sharing safety and security and stability and simply tricks of the trade. Um, one of the things that, that we fear from an ISOC perspective within Australia as we're looking at, at filtering, which is one of the commitments that our new government has made, is apart from slowing down the internet, the, um, uh, a number of us as, as part of the internet side of Australia who are actually out there looking in child safety areas. These are women who run offices who run yeah. support for you know, keeping kids safe on the net for a very yeah. long time. Is we also don't want allow, to allow and encourage our parents to have no responsibility. We yeah. could bring these children up into a rarefied atmosphere. It's a multi-stakeholder which, which approach. Which doesn't, doesn't actually give them any real-world experience no. as well. So we don't want to see very, very complex. No, I'm out of car at the moment. I'm very sorry about so, no, 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 sorry. It would be in a database for people. Yeah.